The volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway is a 500 mile journey through Northern California and Southern Oregon that passes by many volcanoes, waterfalls, amazing scenery, charming small towns, and two national parks on its journey through the southern end of the Cascade Range. Me and my grandpa spent three days driving the volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway and while we didn't get to see everything there is to see along the byway, we certainly had a great time and we hope you will join us on our journey as we take you along with us. All right, Grandpa, where are we heading today? Oh, we're heading up to Red Bluff to do some stuff and then we're heading to Lassa National Park. Yep, and what road are we gonna be traveling on these next couple of days? The Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway. Yep. All right, my next question to you, and I know you probably don't know the full answer to this, and that's okay, because I'm going to explain it now, but do you know where the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway starts and ends? I'm not really sure. I know it passes, obviously, through Last National Park and ends up in Crater Lake, but in between, I'm kind of lost on that. So. All right, so do you want me to tell you the simple answer or the more convoluted answer of where the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway it goes? It really doesn't matter, you know, you just go ahead and go for it. So what you said, basically where the byway goes between Lassen National Park and Crater Lake National Park is basically where it goes, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. So the byway actually has technically two southern starting points. So it all, it's technically starts down there by Lake Almanor along Highway 89. And then it also starts at the 36 and 44 split west of Susanville. So it technically goes along both roads. And then the northern end of the scenic byway is just north of Crater Lake National Park along US 97 with Oregon State Route 138. But the byway mainly follows along Highway 89 in California, then briefly joins I-5, and then goes up on Highway 97 into Oregon, and then follows along Oregon State Route 62 up to Crater Lake National Park, and then finally ends, like I said, back at US 97 along Oregon State Route 138. Uh too complicated for me. <laughs> I'm just a driver. Yep. Our first stop along the journey was in the city of Red Bluff to check out the Tehama County Courthouse. The Tehama County Courthouse here in Red Bluff was completed in 2016 and replaced an older courthouse that was in service since 1922. One thing I really like about this courthouse is that it has the California State Seal on the side of the building there where it says the Superior Court of California. I really like how they have the State Seal on the side of the building right here. Yeah, it's uh, kind of, it's different. I haven't, uh, I don't remember seeing a, one of the courthouses that had the, the Great Seal, but this is a newer building, so, uh, you know, they may do it in, uh, mod in modern times now, I don't know. It's a nice touch. Yeah, it is. It looks really nice. All right, you ready to head to Lassen National Park? Yeah, let's do it. Me and my grandpa got gas and food in Red Bluff because our options would be very limited for the rest of the day. One thing to note if you're traveling on Highway 36 up to Lassen National Park is that there are no services between Red Bluff and Lassen National Park. It takes roughly one hour to drive from Red Bluff to Lassen National Park and you are also treated with awesome views of Lassen Peak as you make your way up into the mountains from the Central Valley. Just past the town of Mineral, me and my grandpa made a left turn onto Highway 89 which took us into Lassen Volcanic National Park. This is also where we begun our journey on the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway. Welcome to Lassen Volcanic National Park. Here we are. Just beyond the park entrance is the Ko Yamini Visitor Center, which provides services such as food, restrooms, and information about the park. All right, so me and my grandpa made it to the visitor center here, just inside Lassen National Park here at the southern entrance. I'm not gonna try to pronounce the name of the visitor center, but we made it. Yeah, here we are. So we're gonna go in and check it out and then work our way through the park, do some sightseeing. Yep. The visitor center is by far the largest visitor center in the park and is located just past the southern entrance and features a number of shops and information about the park itself. One thing that's really cool is that they have this outline of the park right inside the main entrance there when you walk in. Much of the park was affected by the Dixie Fire which burned through the area about two years ago. 
The Dixie Fire burned over 960,000 acres and is the largest single fire in California history. As much as 68% of the park was affected by the Dixie Fire. The Dixie Fire burned from the west side of the Sierra Nevada mountains and burned all the way to Highway 395 near Honey Lake. So Lassen Peak is the southernmost volcano in the Cascade Range. And here on the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway, we'll be passing by Lassen Peak, Black Butte, Mount Shasta, the Medicine Lake Volcanoes, Mount McLaughlin, and of course up to Crater Lake in Oregon. One thing that's really cool about Lassen Volcanic National Park is that you can literally see every type of major volcano in the world inside the park. Lassen Peak itself is a plug dome volcano. Of course, Lassen Peak is famous for its various eruptions between 1914 and 1921, with the biggest eruption being on May 22, 1915. Lassen Peak was the first major volcano to erupt on U.S. mainland in the history of the United States, and it was also one of the very first ones photographed. I really love this photo showing the eruption of Lassen Peak from Red Bluff, California, where we were earlier in the day, just to put things into perspective. That was a nice visit to the visitor center. Did you like it? Yeah, it's really nice. It's uh, um, pretty well stocked with stuff. You know, it's a typical uh, tourist trap, but it's pretty cool. A lot of great um, information in there. Yeah, the informational side of it is really good. It has uh, a lot of information. Uh, side note, this building right here of this visitor center was almost completely under snow this winter. Yep, and it almost burned in the Dixie Fire a couple years ago. You can literally see the dead trees right over there. Yeah. But it's still standing. Yeah, sure is. All right, you ready to continue up the road? Yeah, let's go. Our next stop in Lassen National Park was at the Sulphur Works, which features a number of fumaroles and mud pots. It only takes about one to two minutes to walk from the parking lot up to where the mud pots and fumaroles are, and it's even wheelchair accessible, and it's located right off the side of the park road. You smell that? Yeah, that's uh, sulphur coming out of these, uh, coming out of this area here. Uh, it's a volcanic activity here with mud pots and fumaroles. The Sulphur Works is by far the easiest of all the park's hydrothermal areas that you can access since it's right off the main park road and an easy walk from the parking lot. All of the park's hydrothermal areas are connected to the same volcanic boiler, forming the most striking hydrothermal system in the Cascade Range, and it's on full display here at Sulphur Works in Lassen Volcanic National Park. It's really cool to see all these areas just boiling right off the side of the road. Of course, the landscape is also very striking with its many vivid colors on full display here at the Sulphur Works. Very colorful landscapes here. Well, yeah, that's uh, the yellow. The yellow stuff here is sulfur. I'm not too sure how good the camera's picking it up, but you could definitely see some steam coming out of those vents there from this observation deck just right off the park road here at the Sulphur Works. Even though much of the area of the park was devastated by the Dixie Fire, this area here near the Sulphur Works was luckily spared from the fire. And it's really beautiful here, just seeing all the various colors and the beautiful landscapes all around us. You begin to climb up in elevation as you leave the Sulphur Works on the park road as you continue your journey on Lassen Volcanic National Park. I noticed there was an abundance of wildflowers while we were visiting here in late July of 2023. Our next stop on the park road was at a viewpoint looking at Brokoff Mountain. Brokoff Mountain is a remnant of Mount Tehama and is the second highest point in Lassen National Park after Lassen Peak itself. Mount Tehama was a stratovolcano that once stood here about 600,000 years ago. And Brokoff Mountain is the largest remnant of Mount Tehama. As you leave behind the Brokoff Mountain area, you continue your journey on the park road. You can really see the damage left behind by the Dixie Fire. This was our first time visiting Lassen National Park after the Dixie Fire, which burned through the area here in 2021, and it's just amazing to see how much of the park was affected by the fire. The fire damage is especially noticeable as you look out towards the east from the park road.
Even after seeing all the fire damage, it was amazing to pull over to the side of the road and seeing all these wildflowers blooming here in the park just two years after the fire. It just goes to show that even after a destructive fire, life can come back very quickly here in the mountains. As we continued to climb up in elevation along the park road as we approached the summit near Lassen Peak, we noticed that the fire damage wasn't so bad over here on this side of the park. While standing here on the side of the road, my grandpa noticed that there was a waterfall out there in the distance. Our next stop on our journey through Lassen Volcanic National Park was at Emerald Lake which is one of three lakes that can be accessed directly off the main park road through the park. It wasn't too long when we pulled off the side of the road there and got to the lake to see where the lake got its name from. The lake perfectly reflects the nearby mountains and trees off the water here. It is just picture perfect and like a mirror. Emerald Lake sits just over 8,000 feet above sea level and is mostly covered with snow and ice most of the year. And when it is ice free, it is one of the most beautiful lakes in the park. Just look how crystal clear the waters are here. All right, what do you think of this area here by Emerald Lake? Yeah, it's a really pretty area here. This uh, area looks like it got spared by the fire. And uh, this is a nice, uh, pretty, pretty little mountain uh, lake. Most of your mountain lakes look like this. They take on the hue of the sky, and it's pretty blue today, so uh, it's pretty blue, but it's, it's also very clear. Yep, you can see way out there in the lake. Yeah, quite a ways. Very beautiful area here, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I just can't get over the clarity of this water right here. You could almost drink it, although I wouldn't recommend it. All right, are you ready to head on? Yeah, let's head on down the road. Or up the road in this case. Up the road, yeah, sorry, I'm stupid. <laughs> <laughs> One area of the park we really wanted to see was Bumpus Hell, which features the largest geothermal area in the park, but unfortunately it was closed when we were passing through here in July of 2023. Our next stop on our journey through Lassen National Park was at Lake Helen. Lake Helen is one of the most popular stops in the park because of its location near the base of Lassen Peak and its crystal clear waters. The waters at Emerald Lake were amazing, but here at Lake Helen, I think they're even better. Just look at the clarity of the water here. Everything's so pristine. This is easily my favorite lake in Lassen National Park. Lake Helen is a must stop if you're passing through Lassen National Park and is located just south of the Park Road Summit in Lassen Peak. Much like Emerald Lake, Lake Helen is frozen over most of the year because of its high elevation. And according to a few posts that I saw online a few days prior to our trip, this was one of the very first ice-free days of the year because it was such a heavy snow year this year in California. Pretty amazing views here at Lake Helen in Lassen National Park, huh? Yeah, it's really pretty here also. This is my personal favorite lake and I think a lot of other people's as well for obvious reasons. Yeah, it's really uh, it's really a pretty lake. It's, uh, you can really see the level, the areas where uh, the depths are here. And you also get uh, reflection off the sky in the deeper section out there where it's deep. As you can see right up here, it's the lighter blue color. And then right here, it's taking on the color of the rocks. Yep. Yeah, it's a gorgeous area. Then of course you got Lassen Peak right there on the horizon. Yep, staring you right in the face. Out of its one eye right there. <laughs> At first I didn't know what my grandpa was talking about, but you can actually see an eye right there on the south face of Lassen Peak looking right at you there at Lake Helen. Hey grandpa. Yeah. Snowball fight. Yep, snowball fight in July. Almost August. Yep. It is July 29th and there's still plenty of snow up here. Man, I hate to leave this place, but we got to continue on the road, huh? Yeah, we got to get down the road or up the road or whatever to, uh, there's some more stuff to see, so. I think our next stop is Mount Lassen parking lot. Yep, which is literally right up the road over there. All right, ready to hit the road? Yep, sure am, let's go. 
It is only about a two minute car ride from the Lake Helen area to the Lassen Peak Trailhead. Right here at the Lassen Peak Trailhead, you are sitting at the highest point on the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway and the highest paved road in the Cascade Range, which goes all the way up to British Columbia in Canada. You are sitting 8,512 feet above sea level here at this point. Me and my grandpa just spent some time here at the Lassen Peak Trailhead, just taking in the views of Lassen Peak and reminiscing about our time that we actually climbed Lassen Peak back around 2009 or 2010. Lassen Peak sits 10,457 feet above sea level and is the second highest volcano on the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway. All right, so me and my grandpa are here at the trailhead to climb Lassen Peak and unfortunately we're not gonna do that today just because one, me personally, I'm not in shape and I don't think my grandpa is either and I don't wanna put him through a strenuous hike here for safety and health reasons, but we actually climbed Lassen Peak about 14 years ago, didn't we? Yeah, we sure did, yeah, it was uh... This was before the YouTube days. Yeah, way before. <laughs> yep, but we yeah, did it. We did. It was, uh, it's not a terribly difficult hike, but it is. You're going to look quite a few switchbacks. I believe the trail round trip is about 2.5 miles and you gain just under 2,000 feet of elevation. It's actually a pretty easy trail, all things considered, compared to other mountains you can climb in this area, so. Yeah, that's true, it is. Pretty crazy to see all this snow up here. And it's almost August. It's like July 29th right now, so it's basically August. Yeah, there's a lot here. This this snow that's right here is probably from the parking lot, more than likely. They pushed it up in, up in here, but there's still a lot of snow up here. Yep. One thing that was really interesting was that there really wasn't that many people in the park. Me and my grandpa were here on a Saturday in late July, which is the peak summer season, and there just really wasn't that many people here in the park. Lassen National Park only averages about 500,000 visitors a year and is one of the least visited parks in California. Nothing wrong with a little advertising, huh? No, it's good. It's good to do that. You know, you got, uh, you might get more, more subscribers and, uh, you know. As of the recording of this video, I'm just over 400 subscribers away from 20,000. That's quite an achievement. Yep. Cool. It is all downhill from the Lassen Peak area as you make your way north on the park road through Lassen National Park. Our next stop was a scenic pullout where we can look out towards the east and south towards Lake Almanor and the northern Sierra Nevada mountains. Out in the distance there you can clearly see Lake Almanor which is a reservoir along the North Fork Feather River and you can also see more damage caused by the Dixie Fire. To put things into perspective, the Dixie Fire burned an area of about the size of Rhode Island. You got pretty amazing views looking out there to the east, out towards Lake Almanor and other areas of the northern Sierra Nevada mountains. Yeah, it's a gorgeous uh, view, but except for right down below us down there, we got more of the more of the fire damage right down below as you can see. But, yep. Uh, the Dixie fires went all the way to Highway 395 near Honey Lake. Yeah, it's a long distance from here. Our next stop in Lassen National Park was at the Kings Creek Meadow area here, which offers amazing views back towards Lassen Peak, and you also get to play in the streams here along Kings Creek in this lush meadow. The upper meadow area here along Kings Creek offers great views back towards Lassen Peak and is also a great place to check out wildlife if there's wildlife in the area. Unfortunately, we didn't see any while we were here. What a really nice meadow here with awesome views of Lassen Peak right here off Kings Creek, huh? Yeah, this is really pretty right here. This is a typical uh, mountain meadow. I'm surprised uh, there's not deer, in, deer grazing in here, you know, but uh, too many people, probably. Yep. But it's a nice view of that uh, that side a lot. The uh, of Lassen up there on the side there. Yep. Of course, you got Kings Creek winding its way through the meadow right here. Man, look how clear that water is. That is amazing. 
Another popular hike in this area of the park is Kings Creek Falls. Unfortunately, we didn't have enough time to do it on this trip. Let me know if you've done it in the comments, I would love to check it out someday in the future. Man, I just love how this creek is just snaking through this meadow right here and just kind of flowing with the land. Yeah, it's just a, a typical little stream running through a meadow, you know, it's, uh, that's what they do. And I just can't get over how clear the water is right here. And I just really love this scene right here with this like horseshoe bend. Yeah, that's uh, the lay of the land. Me and my grandpa continued about 20 minutes up the road from the Kings Creek Meadow area and unfortunately we passed through many areas that were devastated by the Dixie Fire. Our next stop in Lassen National Park was at Hot Rock, which is a large boulder that was placed there after the 1915 eruption of Lassen Peak. This 300-ton rock was once in the vent of Lassen Peak before it erupted. During the eruption of 1915, a lahar carried this boulder down to its present location. The rock's internal temperature is estimated to have been 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit when it tumbled down Lassen Peak and was too hot to touch even months after the eruption. This is a pretty big rock that came off Lassen Peak during the 1915 eruption, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's huge. It's about, it's as big as a small cabin. It's bigger than our car. Oh yeah. And heavier too. Yeah. After visiting Hot Rock, me and my grandpa drove about 10 minutes down the road up towards the north entrance of the park where we stopped at Manzanita Lake and the visitor center there where we also went to go check out the Loomis Museum. Of course, Lassen Peak is named after Peter Lassen. All of the photographs of the eruption of Lassen Peak were taken by Benjamin Franklin Loomis, and this museum here near Manzanita Lake was dedicated to him. There's a lot of great photographs here that are on display of all the photographs that he took during the 1914 and 1915 eruptions of Lassen Peak. It is just really incredible to think that even back then we had the technology to capture all this on film, and it's all on display here at this museum. Another cool thing that they have in this museum is all these Native American artifacts and crafts that were made by Native Americans who lived in this area before white settlement. One thing I think is really cool is that they have the box camera here that all the photos of Lassen Peak during the eruptions of 1914 and 15 are displayed here in the museum. I think that's just a really cool piece of history that they have here. a pretty cool museum, huh? Yeah, it was. It had a lot of uh, really cool information in there about the eruption in uh, what, 1915. Yep. So yeah, it was pretty nice. A lot, a lot of stuff in there. They even had the camera that all the photos were taken on. Yeah. On display in there, which was really cool. Yeah, it was. It was nice. After visiting the Loomis Museum, me and my grandpa had one final stop left in Lassen National Park, and that was at Manzanita Lake, which offers great views back towards Lassen Peak. While hiking along the trail around Manzanita Lake, we saw some baby coots playing in the water. They were the cutest little things I've ever seen. All right, so me and my grandpa are just hiking here along Manzanita Lake. And what animals did we just see? Well, we just saw a coot which is a very common water bird 
But that's the first time in my life I've ever seen baby coots. Really? Yeah, because we had we used to have uh, coots all the time at uh, at the River Club. Uh huh. But we did, but they never had babies. Yeah. It's the first time I've ever seen a baby coot. That's pretty cool. It is. Manzanita Lake is located just past the north entrance to Lassen National Park and is pretty famous for having a perfect reflection of Lassen Peak off the water there at the lake. Manzanita Lake is also one of the few areas of the park that is accessible in the wintertime because the lake is much lower in elevation and sits just under 6,000 feet above sea level and therefore doesn't get as much snow as other areas of the park in the wintertime. There is a two mile long trail that goes all the way around Manzanita Lake here in the park. It is one of the easiest trails in the park and is one of the most popular as well. As our time was wrapping up here in Lassen National Park, me and my grandpa were just taking our time along this trail and just really soaking in the views here in Lassen National Park before it was time to continue our journey on the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway. There is a perfect reflection of Lassen Peak and Chaos Crags here off the water at Manzanita Lake. You get really nice reflections of Lassen Peak off Manzanita Lake here. Yeah, you got some really good pictures of it. Uh, I didn't realize that uh, you could get uh, that much, that good of an image, but it's really, really good. Yeah. And unfortunately, this is going to conclude our time in Lassen National Park. I'm a little sad that we're going to be leaving, but we had an awesome day, didn't we? Yeah, we had a good day. It's just sad, uh, it's sad because of that stupid fire, though. I'll tell you, it's uh, pretty devastated up here. Yep. It's still beautiful though. Yeah, it is. It's time to head out of Lassen National Park and continue our journey on the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway. Where are we heading for tonight? Oh, we're heading to Bernie. Which is about an hour north of where we are now, so we'll see you guys down the road. Okay. After leaving behind Manzanita Lake, me and my grandpa made our way out of Lassen National Park and up to the Highway 44 Junction where we continued our journey on the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway. Me and my grandpa spent our first night on the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway in the town of Bernie, which is located about an hour north of Lassen National Park. Highway 89 joins Highway 44 for about 13 miles between Lassen National Park and the town of Old Station. Highway 44 turns east at the town of Old Station to continue its journey to Highway 36 just west of Susanville. Highway 44 is also part of the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway, but we just continued our journey north on Highway 89. Right after the Highway 44-89 split, the scenery really opens up and you can see the next volcano in line in the Cascade Range, and that is Mount Shasta. And we will be seeing plenty of Mount Shasta on day two of our trip on the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway. The town of Bernie is actually located about 5 miles west of the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway along Highway 299, and we made a left turn onto Highway 299 to get to our hotel for the evening. Alright, so me and my grandpa finally made it to our hotel here in Bernie. What did you think of your first day on the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway? It was fun. I had a good time, you know. Uh, I haven't been in Lassen Park in a lot of years. Uh, well, it doesn't look the same. It's, you know, since they had the fire, it's pretty, pretty sad, but it's, uh, it's, I had a good time. Yeah, me too. Tomorrow, our destination is Klamath Falls, and we're going to be seeing a lot of stuff tomorrow in both Northern California and Southern Oregon, so I'm hoping you will look forward to the journey, and I want to thank you all for traveling with us on day one. We'll see you guys tomorrow for day two. All right, it is day two on me and my grandpa's journey on the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway. We're gonna be driving all the way up to Klamath Falls, Oregon today, along Highway 89, I-5, and US-97. We're gonna be seeing a lot of things for the first time, especially you. I've seen a few of the things that we're gonna to see today, but I'm really excited to see your reaction to a lot of the places that we're gonna see later today. Yeah, um, like you said, there's a lot of things that I haven't seen, so I'm kinda of looking forward to seeing it, so let's get going. 
And one thing I want to point out is that my grandpa apparently dressed for the occasion because we're actually going to be passing through weed <laughs> and Interstate 5 today. I don't know if you did that intentionally or not, but look at his shirt. No, I just grabbed a shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that was pretty good. That was a good choice for today because we're yeah. actually going to be passing through there. So, all right, it's time to get breakfast and we will see you guys at Bernie Falls shortly. My grandpa and I drove about five minutes back east on Highway 299 where we met back up with Highway 89 and the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway. And it was about a 10 minute ride up the road from the 299 junction to MacArthur Bernie Falls State Park. The park opens at 8 a.m. and my grandpa and I were here at quarter after 8 on a Sunday morning in late July and the main parking area was almost full. Be sure to get here early as this is a pretty popular park. Alright, me and my grandpa made it to Bernie Falls and shout out to my grandpa for getting us a discount to get in for this senior pass. Yeah, I saved a whole dollar. <laughs> <laughs> How does that make you feel? Oh, it's just wonderful. <laughs> I spent my whole life in this state paying taxes and I got a dollar off. <laughs> Lucky me. <laughs> okay, so you got a weed sweatshirt and a weed shirt. Did you like plan this out before we went on the trip because we're going there or what? No, I didn't. I just started grabbing stuff, <laughs> you know, to pack and that's just what I grabbed. So you love weed? Yeah. <laughs> like actually? Yeah. <laughs> what kind of weed are we talking about here? Oh. <laughs> you high, bro? No. You're high I'm in high, elevation. High on life, I guess. You're high in elevation, too. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> From the parking area, it's only about 150 feet to get an overlook of Burning Falls, and then it's about a third of a mile as you hike down to the base of the falls itself. Me and my grandpa decided to go check out the Bernie Falls Overlook first before we started to hike down towards the falls. And we even saw some squirrels in the area as well. The Bernie Falls Overlook offers a great view of Bernie Falls from above. It is truly one of California's most beautiful waterfalls. The hike down to Bernie Falls takes roughly 5 minutes from the Bernie Falls Overlook and unfortunately it is not wheelchair accessible as there are a number of steps on the way down. There are a few information plaques that talk about the history of the falls and then the animals that live in the area of the state park as well. And then you also get a view of the falls as you're making your way down to the base and you can hear the roar of the waterfall all the way from the parking lot. It's quite awesome that this amazing waterfall is fed by a spring that only surfaces just about a mile upstream from the falls. Bernie Falls is fed by Bernie Creek and springs that flow year-round through the porous basalt cliffs left behind by previous eruptions and lava flows through the area. What makes Bernie Falls unique is the fact that it has hundreds of smaller waterfalls on each side of the main waterfall that creates a veil of waterfall stretching roughly 250 feet in length at its widest point. Bernie Falls is 129 feet tall and cascades at a rate of 100 million gallons of water per day, even during the dry summer months. It is truly one of California's most spectacular waterfalls and is my personal favorite one in Northern California. Bernie Falls was even called the eighth wonder of the world by U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt. And the falls are at their most intense during the spring months when the snow melt is at its peak. MacArthur Bernie Falls Memorial State Park was established in 1926 and protects 910 acres and is the second oldest state park in the California state park system. The falls and park are named after Samuel Bernie, who lived in the area in the 1850s, and the MacArthur family were pioneer settlers who also arrived in the area in the late 19th century. It's way easier going down than it is going up, isn't it? That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> We're about halfway up. 
It is 9 a.m. on a Sunday morning here in July. And as you can see, the parking lot's pretty full. The park here opens at 8 a.m., so be sure to get here early, especially on weekends in the summertime. It is pretty popular. And shout out to my grandpa, who made it up the hill. Yeah, I made it. Pretty awesome place, huh? Yeah, it is. It's a gorgeous waterfall. If you haven't never seen it, you should come and uh, make a trip up here and see it because it's, uh, it's quite fabulous. All right, you ready to continue our journey on the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway? Yep, sure am. All right. After visiting Bernie Falls, me and my grandpa made our way back to Highway 89 to continue our journey on the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway. We passed by some incredible scenery as we made our way north up towards McLeod Falls and you also enter Siskiyou County as you make your way north on the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway. And be sure to be on the lookout for some amazing views of Mount Shasta where the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway is pointing straight at the mountain. It's an awesome sight to see. Those were some awesome views of Mount Shasta here on the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway as we're coming up to the town of McLeod, huh? Yeah, it was. It was a beautiful straight shot right at the mountain. Still a lot of snow on it. But uh, yeah, it's a very uh, pretty sight. Can you see why this is called the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway? Yeah, I, just gotta, I can understand why it's named that, yeah. After driving north on Highway 89 for about an hour, me and my grandpa made our way up towards McLeod Falls, which are three separate waterfalls here on the McLeod River just outside the town of McLeod near the base of Mount Shasta. The first waterfall we saw was the Lower McLeod Falls and it took us about three minutes to get to the parking lot from Highway 89. All right, so me and my grandpa made it here to McLeod Falls. We're at the Lower Falls right now and then we're gonna make our way up to the Middle and Upper Falls later. I've been here before, but you haven't, surprisingly. No, I've never been here, so this will be my first time, so. All right, you looking forward to it? Yeah, let's go check it out, why not? It only takes one minute to walk from the parking area to the overlook for Lower McLeod Falls. Lower McLeod Falls plunges 15 feet over the cliff into a deep pool, which is also a very popular spot for swimming in the summertime. You can view the falls from afar where that observation area is where me and my grandpa were standing, but there are also some stairs down there we can actually get a lot closer to the falls as well. Alright, so what are your thoughts here on Lower McLeod Falls? Yeah, it's a nice looking little falls here. It's, uh, the river's running pretty good right now, so it uh, makes the falls run uh, a lot faster. So yeah, it's nice. It's nice here. Out of the three tiers of the McLeod Falls, Lower McLeod Falls is by far the easiest one you can get close to without running into any issues. As you can see, a lot of people were taking advantage of the water there to cool off during the summertime. The McLeod River is a tributary of the Sacramento River and is approximately 77 miles long and runs from near Mount Shasta to the McLeod Arm of Shasta Lake. Me and my grandpa spent about 20 minutes here just taking in the views and enjoying the scenery here at Lower McLeod Falls. What did you think of Lower McLeod Falls? I liked it. It's cute. It's a nice little falls here. Nice little uh, white water up above it there. So yeah, it's nice. Are you ready to go see Middle McLeod Falls? Yeah, let's go. After visiting the Lower Falls, me and my grandpa made our way up to the Middle Falls, which is about a five minute drive from where the Lower Falls is located. One thing to note is that the lower falls is kind of separated by the middle and upper falls as the middle and upper falls are right next to each other and the lower falls is farther downstream from the other two waterfalls. So just keep that in mind when you're visiting the area. All right, now we're at Middle McLeod Falls, which is my personal favorite. Never been here, so I'll, I, my first time, so I'll take your word for it. And you can see Mount Shasta right behind my grandpa over there. Yep, there it is. 
It only takes about one minute to walk from the parking lot to the observation deck of Middle McLeod Falls. Middle McLeod Falls has a drop of about 50 feet and is almost twice as wide, which makes it one of the most picturesque waterfalls in Siskiyou County, in my opinion. All right, what are your thoughts on the views of Middle McLeod Falls? Oh, I like this one here. This is a lot bigger. It's, uh, it's like a little Bernie, kind of, but I mean, it's nothing like Bernie Falls, but I, you know, it's a wider, a lot wider falls, and it's uh, taller, so it's, uh, it's nice. In my personal opinion, the best way to experience Middle McLeod Falls is to hike down to the base of the falls. It takes roughly 10 minutes to hike down to the base from the observation deck. Down we go. Yep, down we go. Middle McLeod Falls is my personal favorite waterfall in Siskiyou County, California and is my second favorite waterfall in Northern California after Bernie Falls. Much like Bernie Creek, the McLeod River is also spring-fed and has a constant flow year-round. The falls is best experienced during the spring during the peak snowmelt season. All right, what are your thoughts on seeing the Middle Falls from down here? Yeah, it's uh, really neat from down here. It's, uh, like I said, it looks like a kind of like a mini Bernie Falls, although it's not, there's no comparison, but it is a nice falls. It's wide and it's a pretty good drop. You gotta work to get down here though. Yeah, it was work and it's gonna be a hell of a lot more work going up. Woo. You ready for it? Yeah, let's go. Of course, you can also see views of the falls as you're hiking back up to the parking lot. Well folks, my grandpa safely made it back up the hill from Middle McLeod Falls. How you feeling? Okay. I'm a little bit winded, but I'm good. That was a, not a bad hike. I'm proud of you. I made it. Age is just a number. Yeah, that's true. How old are you? 74. If and you can do it, so can you. 74 and counting. <laughs> All right, you ready to go check out the Upper McLeod Falls? Yeah, let's do it. The drive from the Middle Falls to the Upper Falls only takes about two minutes, and luckily when my grandpa and I were here in late July, there was plenty of parking, even on a Sunday. All right, so now me and grandpa made it to the Upper McLeod Falls. Yeah, we're gonna go check it out. And uh, I've never seen this one either, so I don't know what to expect, but I'm sure it's, uh, something to see so we're on our way yep the upper McLeod Falls is a little bit different from the lower and middle falls farther downstream on the McLeod River the upper McLeod Falls starts as a series of cascades as the McLeod River snakes its way through this narrow canyon as it loses elevation and it's nothing but white water for several hundred feet before it drops off there at the end It really amazes me how this volcanic activity has shaped the landscapes and how these rivers have to meander their way down them. Much like the lower falls, the upper falls plunges into a deep pool here as it falls over this basalt cliff. The upper McLeod Falls plunges 30 feet and is the second tallest of the three tiers of the McLeod Falls. Me and my friend Danny were here about a year ago and I was really happy I was able to show my grandpa these three waterfalls here along the McLeod River on the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway. What are your thoughts on Upper McLeod Falls? Well, it's, I liked it. It was different. It's a cascading uh, uh, series of fa little falls coming down, which they call a cascade. So it's, uh, it's, it's nice. It's, uh, it's different. So I, I enjoyed it. Are you happy you got to come here today? Yeah, I am. I've never, like I said, I've uh, never been uh, over here, so it's nice seeing new things once in a while. Yep. And what is your favorite out of the three McLeod Falls? 
Uh, I think Middle Falls. Yeah, mine too. Yeah, it looks like I said before, it looks like a, a miniature Bernie Falls, except it's uh, no comparison, but it's it's a wide falls and it's a, a fairly high falls, probably maybe 20, 25 feet. Yep. All right, are you ready to continue our journey on the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway? Yeah, let's keep going. We still got more waterfalls to see. Oh, for joy. <laughs> After leaving McLeod Falls, we made our way back to Highway 89 and then we continued our journey up the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway. The town of McLeod is home to about a thousand people and offers amazing views of Mount Shasta just to the north of town. It is only about a 10 minute drive from the town of McLeod up to Interstate 5 where Highway 89 ends and the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway continues north on Interstate 5 for about 10 miles. Before continuing our journey north on the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway, my grandpa and I made our way south towards Dunsmuir along I-5 to check out a few more waterfalls in the area as well as eat lunch at a popular food spot there. There is a popular waterfall called Hedge Creek Falls located right off Interstate 5 and exit 732 as you make your way into Dunsmuir, and the parking lot can be found right there at the bottom of the off-ramp off I-5. Alright, me and my grandpa made it to Hedge Creek Falls, which is literally right here off of I-5 in Dunsmuir. Are you ready to go check it out? Yeah, let's go check it out. Either one of us has ever been here, so let's go see what it is. Thanks for advertising for I-5 right there on your shirt. Yeah, it's right here, see? I-5. Be sure to stay on the trail because there is plenty of poison oak along this trail as you make your way down to Hedge Creek Falls. It takes roughly 5 minutes to walk down to Hedge Creek Falls from the parking lot and one thing to note is that the trail can be slippery after it rains or in the winter time when there's snow on the ground so just keep that in mind when you're hiking down here in the winter time. It only takes about 5 minutes to walk down to the waterfall from the parking lot and once you get down there, you're treated to awesome views of a 35-foot waterfall that falls off a columnar basalt cliff that was formed by lava flows from Mount Shasta many years ago. There were quite a number of people there when we were there in late July, so it's a pretty popular spot being right off the freeway and all. What makes Hedge Creek Falls so popular and unique from other waterfalls in California is you can actually walk behind it, and you can see my grandpa walking behind the falls out there in the distance. When you stand behind the waterfall, you definitely get sprayed from the water falling off the cliff there. I'm sure it's a very popular spot on hot summer days. Alright, what are your thoughts on Hedge Creek Falls? That's a nice little waterfall. It's uh, kind of neat the way it, you can get around behind it. and. Uh, Kind of reminds me like of a little uh, Bridal Bale Falls up there on Highway 50. Yep. And so this actually isn't on the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway. It's actually in the town of Dunsmere, about five miles south of the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway. But the only reason we came here is because we're actually going to be eating lunch at a spot here in Dunsmere. So I thought it'd be cool to check this place out while we're here. Yeah, it's nice. You know, I didn't, didn't even know it was here. All right, you ready for lunch? Yeah, let's go. All right, so me and my grandpa are right here in Dunsmere for lunch. We're going to Yaks on the Five, which was voted one of the best restaurants in the United States for multiple years in a row. Yeah, we'll find out. We'll see. All right, you hungry? Yeah, a little bit. Let's go. This place is known for their wild and crazy hamburgers and everything that they make here is homemade, even their famous lavender ketchup. We waited roughly 10 minutes to order our food and roughly another 15 minutes for our food to be ready, but it was definitely worth the wait. They even have 20 local beers on tap here in the restaurant. Yeah, 
That's good. It's not bad. How would you rate it out of 10? I don't know. Eight. <laughs> it's okay. It's good. Well, I really enjoyed my burger. Yeah, it was good. It was, it was a good burger. I, uh, I, I get a little miffed, though, because of these places that are advertised, you know, specialty places, and then it cost me, you know, it cost us almost $50 for two hamburgers and a, a couple of drinks. But other than that, it was good. I enjoyed it. Yep. After having lunch at Yaks on the Five in Dunsmuir, me and my grandpa made our way over to Ferry Falls, which is located not too far from Lake Siskiyou. It looks like there are some sections with some mud and running water, so just keep that in mind if you're hiking this trail. Be sure to check out this marker here on the trail where it tells you that the falls go down this side path right here on the left. After scrambling and making our way down to the falls from the main trail there, we were definitely rewarded with an awesome view of the falls here. Ferry Falls is roughly 40 feet tall and features one main waterfall that ends up splitting into two waterfalls as it makes its way down the cliff. It's definitely a unique and hidden waterfall here in Siskiyou County and you definitely have to work to get to it, but in my opinion the hike is worth it. You gain about 200 feet of elevation on your way from the parking area up to the falls. We spent roughly 10 minutes here just soaking in the view before it was time to make our way back to the car and continue our journey on the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway. Alright, so what did you think of Ferry Falls just out here by Lake Siskiyou? It's a nice, um, it's about a 40 foot falls, it's really nice. It kind of looks like Bernie Falls without all the side water coming down, but uh, it's a nice place. It's a good hike to it though. Yeah, what did you think of the trail coming up here? Well, for me, it was uh, a little rough because it's all uphill, but uh, I, uh, I, made, I made it. I did okay. Yeah, that last section of the trail where you actually hike down to the falls is pretty interesting. But yeah, it's, uh, you got to be careful because it's kind of treacherous down towards the bottom. After visiting Ferry Falls, me and my grandpa made our way back towards the city of Mount Shasta, and we headed over to the headwaters of the Sacramento River, which is located in the Mount Shasta City Park. The views of Mount Shasta from Mount Shasta City are a sight to behold in person. Well, looks like Mr. Red Light strikes again. Yeah, the much curse. At least we got a good view, huh? Yeah, the view's fantastic, jeez. All right, me and Grandpa are here at the Mount Shasta City Park, and we're gonna go check out the headwaters of the Sacramento River. Yeah, I've, I've never been here. It'd be interesting to see how, uh, how that how the river starts, and uh, let's go do it. Yep. It only takes about two minutes to walk from the parking lot over to the headwaters of the Sacramento River, which comes from a spring underneath Mount Shasta. This spring right here is considered to be the source of the Sacramento River, and water gushing from the spring comes from snowmelt on Mount Shasta. The Sacramento River is the largest river by both length and volume in California and is over 400 miles long and starts at this spring right here and travels all the way to the California Delta. It's really cool to see how California's largest river just starts from a simple spring here at the base of Mount Shasta. This spring and its pure water have been revered by the indigenous people of the area for thousands of years and still to this very day it's considered a sacred and holy place to them. While we were visiting here, there were many people here filling up water bottles and various buckets of the pure water coming from the spring. There were also a number of people meditating and just taking in the spirituality of this place as well.
This sign right here shows the Sacramento River watershed, which is the largest watershed entirely within California. One thing I will say though is that this sign is technically incorrect because it shows that Goose Lake is part of the Sacramento River watershed, when in reality Goose Lake hasn't overflowed into the Pitt River in over a century, and Goose Lake is considered part of the Great Basin now. After visiting the headwaters of the Sacramento River in Mount Shasta City, we made our way back to Interstate 5 to continue our journey on the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway. The views of Mount Shasta off to your right when you're driving along this stretch of Interstate 5 are a sight to behold in person. Interstate 5 passes along the west side of Black Butte between Mount Shasta City and the City of Weed. Black Butte is a satellite cone of Mount Shasta and sits 6,325 feet above sea level. Black Butte last erupted about 9,500 years ago and there is also a 2.5 mile trail that leads to the summit of the mountain. After traveling along I-5 for roughly 10 miles, the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway exits off I-5 at exit 747, which is also US-97, and continues along US-97 for the remainder of its journey through California and up into Oregon. Right when you get off the freeway at I-5 onto US-97, you pass through downtown Weed, and be sure to stop at the Weed store there located right at the intersection of US-97 and I-5 when you get off the freeway. All right, Grandpa, where are we right now? Well, we're in Weed, California. Standing right here across the street here is the weed store. So we're going to go in and check it, check it out. Wait, what kind of weed store are we talking about here? Uh, they sell all kinds of stuff. They don't sell weed, but they sell all kinds of stuff. Uh, shirts, all kinds of souvenirs. About the town of Weed, not marijuana. Yeah, it's about the town, not, not marijuana, but... It's really hard to miss the place with all the advertisements outside the building. The weed store is filled with tons of souvenirs ranging from hats, hoodies, t-shirts, stickers, shot glasses, lighters, coffee mugs, and other things related to the city of weed. Did you really think I was talking about marijuana here? Contrary to popular belief, the city of weed is not named after the cannabis plant, but rather named after an early settler named Albner Weed. They make a lot of money at this store here, don't they? Yeah, they sure do. Yeah, it's uh, it's a good business. Uh, it's been here a long time, I think. We've been coming here for years every time we stop through. Yep. Just amazing views of Mount Shasta here in the city of Weed. Right off the I-5 in US-97. After visiting the weed store, me and my grandpa got back on Highway 97 as we drove through the city of weed and continued our journey north on the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway. After you leave the city of weed, the views really open up of Mount Shasta as you pass along the north side of the mountain as you continue your journey north on Highway 97 up towards Oregon. Mount Shasta sits 14,179 feet above sea level and is the tallest mountain in Northern California and the second highest peak in the Cascade Range after Mount Rainier in Washington. It is by far the tallest mountain you will see on the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway. While traveling north on Highway 97 from the Mount Shasta area, be sure to be on the lookout for a scenic pullout that overlooks Mount Shasta and the surrounding area. This is easily my favorite vista point on the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway, and for good reason. There are a number of information plaques here going over the eruptive history of Mount Shasta, as well as other volcanoes in the area as well. Just an awesome view of Mount Shasta right here off Highway 97, the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway. Here on the north side of Mount Shasta, you can really see its glaciers on full display here. Mount Shasta is by far the most heavily glaciated peak in California. Pretty awesome views of Mount Shasta right here, huh? Yeah, it's really an uh, awesome view. You've got Mount Shasta and then you got the to the right you got the pimple on uh, Shast, uh, Shasta's butt, not Shastina. <laughs> I guess that's a good way to put it. Yeah. It's a pretty good sized pimple, I guess. Yeah, it's a big pimple, but that's uh, it's an awesome sight looking at that from here. 
Of course, Mount Shasta is Northern California's tallest mountain and by far the most glaciated peak in California. And all of Mount Shasta's glaciers are on the north face of the mountain, which is what we're looking at right now. Yeah, it faces away from the sun, so that's where the, that's where the glaciers form. After spending some time there at the Mount Shasta Vista Point, we continued our journey north on Highway 97 as we made our way up towards Oregon. We passed through the Mount Hebron Summit area, which was an area that was affected by a fire a number of years ago, and it was really sad to see all the burnt trees along the side of the road. After passing through the Mount Hebron Summit area, we made our way through the Butte Valley and the Butte Valley National Grassland as we made our way up to the town of Doris, which is the last town along the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway in California. And you know you're getting close to the Oregon border when you see an agricultural inspection station along the side of the road. Doris is a small city a few miles south of the Oregon border and is known for having a large flagpole within the city limits and is a very popular landmark there in the city. The city is also known for having three very sharp curves within the center of town along US 97 that's given larger vehicles a few problems over the years. One thing we really wanted to see on our journey on the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway was Lava Beds National Monument, which is located about 45 minutes off the main route of the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway along Highway 161 and Highway 139. It was getting pretty late in the day, so unfortunately we weren't able to make it on this trip. Let me know if you've been to Lava Beds National Monument and if it's worth checking out because I'd love to see it someday. Right after the turnoff that goes to Lava Beds National Monument, we immediately crossed into Oregon, which is our second state here on the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway. I really like this Oregon welcome sign here on Highway 97. It really stands out from the rest of them in the state. Welcome to Oregon on the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway. As you're traveling southbound along US 97 near the California-Oregon border, you get really awesome views of Mount Shasta, even though you're about 50 miles north of the mountain. It just goes to show how much taller Mount Shasta is than its surrounding landscapes. It's really an awesome sight to see. So something that I find really weird about Oregon and their mile markers is that, so basically, in most states, mile zero begins at the western and southern ends of a road in a state, and then it just goes up as you go north and east, respectively. But in Oregon, it seems to be the opposite. So we just passed by mile 288, even though we just crossed into Oregon from California. Typically, it would be mile like two or whatever, but for whatever reason, Oregon does it the opposite way of what most states typically do with their mile marker systems. Yeah, I don't know. I don't understand why they do that. It's kind of, you know, you're coming, you're coming into the state, you know, from the, from the south, and it should start, you know, start from zero and go on up until you leave the state, but it's Oregon, whatever. Yep. You know, I don't know why they do that, but it's kind of stupid. I mean, on I-5, when you enter Oregon from California, it starts at mile zero, which makes sense. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. There's no rhyme or reason to it. It was only about a 15-minute drive up the road from the California-Oregon border to Klamath Falls, which is where we would spend night two of our journey on the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway. Klamath Falls is also the largest city on the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway, so if you need anything like supplies, food, hotels, this place has it all. It's a great place to stay if you're traveling through Oregon on the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway. The first thing we did when we got into Klamath Falls was get gas because this was only the second time we were getting gas on this trip after we got gas the previous day in Red Bluff, California before we went up to Lassen National Park. What's the first thing you learn when you're driving in Oregon? You can't pump your own gas. Yep. It's a pain in the butt. <laughs> and we don't even get cheaper gas prices on this trip through Oregon like we did last year. No, I think they're pretty much the same as uh, in California. We're at a pilot travel center right now and it's still probably the cheapest around right now. Man, those Oregon speed limit signs that don't have the word limit are interesting, aren't they? Because how do you interpret that? <laughs> Oh, I don't, I've never had a problem interpreting them, you know, it just says, whatever it says is the speed limit to me. I know it's not, it's kind of weird not having limit on the sign, but, you know, I know what it means, so. Oregon's the only state that does this. Well, Oregon's a screwy state anyhow, you know that. All right, so me and Grandpa are in downtown Klamath Falls, Oregon to do two things. The first thing is to check out the Klamath County Courthouse here in Klamath Falls, and also to get dinner. Are you looking forward to seeing both? Yeah, I yeah. am. All right, let's go. 
The Klamath County Courthouse was completed in 1998 and replaced an older courthouse that was demolished in 1993 following an earthquake in the area. Alright, so what are your thoughts on the Klamath County Courthouse here in Klamath Falls? I like it. It's a really nice looking building. Uh, it's got a beautiful front on it with all the glass and it's brick. So it's, uh, yeah, it's really nice. I like it. Now, I will always prefer older looking courthouses, but as far as modern courthouses go, this is one of my favorite looking courthouses that I've ever seen. Yeah, I do. I like it too. It's nice. Just to the left of the courthouse, they had a list of all the people who lost their lives serving in various wars throughout our country's history. Of course, all of them being from Klamath County, Oregon. I thought this was a really nice gesture. All right, me and my grandpa just got done visiting the Klamath County Courthouse, and now we're going to go eat dinner here in downtown Klamath Falls at this Mexican restaurant that me and my friend Danny ate at a year ago here. Yeah, let's go try it. Let's see. You said it was pretty good, so let's go. All right, so this place is actually located inside this old bank building here, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah, it's nice. It's an old building. It looks really nice. All right, you hungry? Yeah, I can eat. Let's go. This restaurant is called El Palacio and is located right in downtown Klamath Falls. El Palacio is Spanish for the palace. Mexican food is probably not the first thing that comes to mind when you think of Oregon, but I promise you, this Mexican food here at this restaurant is some of the best I've ever had. Their menu is huge, isn't it? Yeah, it's very huge. There's a, they have a really big selection of uh, whatever you want, or whatever you want to try. Who knew Oregon had good Mexican food? Yeah, well, <coughs> sorry. Yeah, I guess they do. You said you and uh, you and your friend ate here, and you said it was good, so I'm sure I'll take your word for it. I'm sure it was. I'm getting hungry just looking at the menu. Yeah, I know. I think I'll, I think I'll eat the menu. <coughs> that looks amazing, doesn't it? Yeah, it's good. It's good. Thank you. You're very welcome. All right, I'll get your reaction. Yeah, it's good. I like it. You approve? Yeah. I know Mexican food is probably not the first thing that comes to mind when you think of Oregon, but this place really smacks, let me tell you. Yeah, it was, it was excellent, very good. And the service is great, the people are really nice. So I would recommend it to anybody if they're in, the, in, the, uh, in this area. All right, so one thing I noticed on my grandpa's shirt that he's been wearing all day is they misspelled interstate. <laughs> yeah, I guess whoever made the shirt up must have been on weed or something. I don't know. <laughs> Klamath Falls has a very walkable downtown. It has a lot of historic buildings, too. Yeah, it's kind of like um, they converted a lot of the old stores into restaurants and stuff. It's kind of like uh, um, downtown Willow Glen where I grew up. Um, and for people that don't know, Willow Glen is in San Jose. Yeah, and uh, used to be all kinds of stores, but now it's all little specialty shops and stuff. There's a lot of restaurants and bistros. And they've done the same thing down here. Uh, it's really nice. So on there, that sign, you can see Winnemucca, Nevada being advertised. Oh yeah. I Oregon mean, Route 140 is the longest state highway in Oregon. And basically goes from Medford all the way to the Nevada border and then it continues as Nevada State Route 140 and eventually takes you all the way to Winnemucca, Nevada. Well, that's quite a ways. That's a, lot, that's a lot of miles. Yep. Yeah. All right, so me and my grandpa are all checked into our hotel here in Klamath Falls, and that's going to conclude our second day on the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway. What were some of your favorite highlights from today? Well, 
Um, I'm always fascinated by Bernie Falls. I mean, I think it's a most, probably one of the most beautiful waterfalls in the state of California, if not in the whole country, I don't know. Um, but all the rest of the places that we went to, the McLeod Falls, the three of them was were nice, really nice. Actually, everything we did today, I really enjoyed, including our uh, Mexican dinner that we had uh, in downtown, down in the downtown area. So that's pretty much it for me. All right, and tomorrow's agenda is Crater Lake National Park, where we will continue our journey and finish our journey on the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway. Thanks for traveling with us on day two, and we'll see you tomorrow for day three. All right, good night. All right, it is day three on our journey on the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway. And where are we going today? We're going to Crater Lake. Yep. It is a little bit hazy this morning, which is what I was afraid of because there are fires burning in the Pacific Northwest and we got really spoiled the first two days with amazing weather and no smoke. So looks like we're paying for our good fortunes the last two days. Yeah, but we'll do the best we can, you know, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll get it done one way or the other. Me and Grandpa just got a car wash because Grandpa decided to park under a tree that dumped sap all over our car last night at our hotel, so... Yeah, lucky me. <laughs> but hey, it looks pretty good now. Yeah. yeah Alright, you ready to hit the road? Yeah, let's do it. After getting our car washed, me and my Grandpa made our way through downtown Klamath Falls as we made our way back towards Highway 97 and the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway. I said it earlier, but I really love how the downtown area of Klamath Falls looks. It looks really nice and organized and neat, and everything is really clean as well. They did a really nice job with the downtown area. All right, so spoiler alert, we're actually not going to be following the entirety of the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway between here and Crater Lake. So the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway between Klamath Falls and Crater Lake actually goes along Oregon State Route 140, and then basically follows just a county road that goes up to Highway 62. We're going to go the much faster way of Highway 97 to 62, which goes along the east shore of Klamath Lake. Okay, well, whatever, whatever we got to do. Plus, sir, we're not going to be doing much filming today just because of the smoky conditions, and hopefully it's not too bad up there in Crater Lake, but I'm not holding my breath on that. Yeah, I was just, uh, it's too bad because I got these guys, they got these wildfires going up here in Oregon, and it looks like the wind shifted, and it's setting the smoke down to where we are right now so we'll do the best we can yeah Oregon and Washington had a much milder winter compared to us in California and their conditions are a lot more drier up here and much more prone to wildfire so as you can see it's pretty hazy out here from the smoke from the wildfires as we made our way up highway 97 from Klamath Falls and then we passed along the eastern shore of upper Klamath Lake here and you can only see for about 5-10 miles in front of you Normally on a clear day across Upper Klamath Lake you would be able to see Mount McLaughlin which is the highest point in southern Oregon. Mount McLaughlin sits 9,496 feet above sea level and is even referred to as America's Mount Fuji due to its resemblance to Mount Fuji in Japan. Unfortunately due to the hazy conditions I was not able to get any pictures or videos of it from this trip but here are a few photos that I took from previous trips around the area. If I'm being perfectly honest, I was debating not even going to Crater Lake National Park and just returning home to California and canceling the rest of the trip altogether due to the hazy conditions when we woke up from our hotel that morning. I didn't want to go to Crater Lake and have it be smoky to where we couldn't see anything, but something inside of me told me to just go anyways because it would be worth it and I'm glad that my gut feeling was right this time around. After traveling on Highway 97 non-stop since Weed, California, our journey on the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway made us turn onto Highway 62 as we made our way up to Crater Lake National Park. Highway 62 is also referred to as the Crater Lake Highway for its entire length. As we continued our journey on Highway 62 up towards Crater Lake National Park, I'm really happy to say that the hazy conditions got much better and the sky was becoming more blue by every passing mile. We were really looking forward to the scenery in Crater Lake National Park just about 30 minutes down the road. Alright Grandpa, I'm a little sad that today is our last day on the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway, but we're going to go out with a bang. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll get it done one way or the other. It looks like it started to clear up, uh, up this way. It was really smoky this morning at our hotel, but it looks like it's all south now for some reason. I don't know why, but it looks like it's... You can see the clouds up there over towards uh, Crater Lake, so I think we're going to be okay. 
Yep, and you can actually see the mountains around Crater Lake right out there in the distance. You can make out Mount Scott out there, which is the highest point in the park, and then some other mountains that surround Crater Lake. Of course, Crater Lake used to be part of Mount Mazama before that collapsed, and then Crater Lake was formed about 7,700 years ago. Yeah, I think uh, it looks like we might get lucky and uh, continue on with our filming, so. Yep, without too much uh, worrying about smoke or anything like that. This sign right here paints a good visual of what Mount Mazama would have looked like in this area if it still existed today. So this sign right here actually talks about Mount Mazama that once stood here before it erupted about 7,700 years ago and formed Crater Lake. It would be standing right out there in the distance. And then right here where we're actually standing is actually the very bottom of Crater Lake. Yeah. We're about 4,230 feet above sea level right here. Then the surface elevation of the lake is about 6,173 feet. Yeah, it's uh, pretty interesting. Of course, the largest remnant of Mount Mazama is Mount Scott, which you can see out there in the distance. And Mount Scott is the highest point in Crater Lake National Park. Highway 62 begins to climb up in elevation once you leave behind the scenic pull out there as you get closer to Crater Lake National Park. And once you enter Crater Lake National Park, the road quality deteriorates severely and I guess it's under the jurisdiction of the National Park Service at that point. And another thing to note is that Highway 62 through Crater Lake National Park is one of the few areas of the park that is kept open in winter. Welcome to Crater Lake National Park along the volcanic, legacy, scenic byway. There is a waterfall you can see called Annie Falls, which is located right off Highway 62, about five miles past the East Park entrance there on Highway 62. All right, so me and my grandpa are in a small section of Crater Lake National Park here off Highway 62. Technically, we're in the park, but it's the free portion of the park that the highway passes through without having to pay an entrance fee. Yeah, it goes for a few miles. Like, I don't know how many miles it is, but... Um, we're standing here at Annie Falls, which is yeah. mostly a cascading waterfall here along yeah, Highway 62. It's down in a canyon down there. After visiting Annie Falls, we made our way about 10 minutes up the road to the south entrance of Crater Lake National Park, where we made a right turn to make our way up towards Rim Drive, which goes around Crater Lake. Interestingly enough, there wasn't an attendant there collecting fees when we passed through here about 10 a.m. on July 31st of 2023, although there was an attendant there collecting fees about five hours later when we left the park. One thing to note is that Rim Drive was actually partially closed on the east side of the park due to road construction because the east side of Rim Drive over there is in pretty rough condition. Understandably so with the rough winters that they get here in Crater Lake National Park. We drove as far as we could to the road closures on the east side of the park there on Rim Drive and here are some of our highlights from driving around Crater Lake and Crater Lake National Park. All right, so me and Grandpa made it to Crater Lake National Park and we're gonna go check out Vide Falls here along Rim Drive. Yeah, we're on the east side of the of the park right now, so we're gonna go check out this waterfall. All right, let's go. Okay. V-Day Falls is roughly 100 feet tall and is the tallest waterfall in Crater Lake National Park. It is one of the most popular waterfalls in the park and by far the easiest one to access since it's right off the main park road. To get a good full view of the falls, you really have to step over to the right where you can really see the height of the waterfall as it makes its way down the mountain here towards Rim Drive. This is a great first stop if you're driving east along Rim Drive around Crater Lake National Park. Alright, so what do you think of the falls? Yeah, I thought it was pretty cool. It, uh... Until you get off way off to the side, you really can't see way to the top, but it's quite a quite a long drop there. I think it's over 100 feet. Yep. Uh, but it's uh, it's distinct. You ready to go see more things in Crater Lake? Yeah, let's go. All right, we're here at Sun Notch, and it's about a 0 0.5 mile hike to go check out the Phantom Ship Overlook. So we'll see how this goes. Yeah, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> I'm not worried about me, but I'm more worried about you. No, I should be okay. It's not that. It's only half a mile, and it's we're doing the upgrades, upgrade stuff first, so I'll be okay. 
Within less than a minute of hiking on the trail, we saw our first wildlife here in Crater Lake National Park. We saw two deer grazing in the forest here along the trail. It's in these instances where being in the right place in the right time works out in your favor. All right, we got our first wildlife sighting on our second hike. Well, technically first hike, but. Yeah, it was two does. One was bigger than the other, so the other one might have been about a couple years old or maybe going on three, a little smaller. So anyhow, yeah. All right, you ready to continue up the trail? Yeah. Did the deer have a little doe? Yeah, two bucks. <laughs> <laughs> This trail is pretty straightforward and easy to follow. Yeah, it is. It looks like it's a loop trail though. There's a, a right turn up here too. Yep. It took us roughly 10 minutes to walk from the parking area up to the viewpoint of Crater Lake and the Phantom Ship Overlook. When we got to the top, we saw the crystal clear blue waters of Crater Lake for the first time. It was amazing to see how blue the water was. Pretty awesome views up here, huh? Yeah, it's gorgeous, yeah, really, really nice. So before today, when's the last time you were in Crater Lake National Park? Because I went to Crater Lake in 2015 and 2020 and you weren't with me either of those times. Um, I'd have to say probably uh, maybe 15 years ago. Sounds about right. I'm not really sure. Does it still look as good as ever? Oh, of course. Yeah, it's gorgeous. At least there's, uh, there's no freaking burn scars up here, so it's, it's still a pristine park. Just an awesome view right here of Crater Lake. Right down there, you could just see how fast Crater Lake drops off. You could really see the depths of the lake down there. Yeah, you really can. Yeah, it's, uh, it drops off pretty fast. And uh, point of interest, there's still snow down there. Still got little patches of snow. Yep, it is the last day of July, July yep. 31st, yep. 2023. It's a gorgeous lake. Are you glad we took this trail? Oh yeah, absolutely. Right here is the Phantom Ship Overlook, and you can clearly see the Phantom Ship out there in the distance. The Phantom Ship is one of just two islands in Crater Lake and is 170 feet high and 500 feet long and 200 feet wide. Out in the distance there, you can see Mount Thielsen, which is one of Oregon's Matterhorns. And before 2021 was home to the southernmost glacier in Oregon. But I guess the big heat wave of 2021 in the Pacific Northwest melted it. All right, it's time to head back to the car and continue our journey on Rim Drive. Yep, let's uh, head on down the road here. I hate to leave this view behind, but I'm sure there's more amazing views down the road. Oh, I'm sure we're just getting started, so. Yep. Let's head on down. Our next stop on Rim Drive around Crater Lake brought us to Kerr Notch, which offers another view of the Phantom Ship. The Phantom Ship actually has the oldest rocks in the Crater Lake Basin and they date back over 400,000 years. more awesome views huh yeah everywhere you stop there's different views to see but it's it's awesome I was super happy I made the decision to end up going to Crater Lake National Park and not canceling the trip due to the wildfire smoke when we woke up this morning in our hotel it was just an absolutely beautiful and perfect day in Crater Lake National Park here when we went you get a really good view of Wizard Island from this overlook right here 
It is the largest island in Crater Lake. Do the views ever stop getting good around Crater Lake? No, they're always great views wherever you go. So far, every stop we made here on the east side has been great. Our next stop on Rim Drive was to get a look at the Pumice Castle. The Pumice Castle was formed when pumice and other lavas welded together at high temperatures. And of course, you have more amazing views of Crater Lake here at the Pumice Castle Overlook. Some interesting rock formations here on the east side of the lake. Yeah, there's a, uh, the one thing that stands out is that Pumice Castle that's over, right over there. It's, uh, it reminds me of the hoodoos in Bryce Canyon National Park in Utah. Yeah, it does. It's, uh, it's interesting because it's a totally different color from everything that's around it. Our next stop on Rim Drive was the Cloud Cap Overlook, which is the highest point in the park you can access by a road and is also the highest paved road in Oregon. The Cloud Cap Overlook is one of the most popular viewpoints in the park because it offers panoramic views without any obstruction of Crater Lake. Another cool thing about the Cloud Cap Overlook is that the deepest point in Crater Lake is just off the shore there. Crater Lake reaches a depth of 1,943 feet or 592 meters deep. It is the deepest lake in the United States and the second deepest in North America, and by some definitions, it's either the 8th, 9th, or 10th deepest lake in the world. All right, so what do you think of this view here from the Cloud Cap Overlook? It's the highest point on road in the park, and it just offers amazing views of the entire lake from up here. Yeah, it's a really good view. You can see the whole lake from here. Yeah, and you can also see the clouds that are formed. Got a few, not, they're not thunderheads, but you can actually see them in the lake right now. It's like a mirror. Have you ever seen a bluer lake? Probably not, no. So not only is this the highest road in the park, but it's also the highest paved road you can access in the state of Oregon. We're about 7,750 feet above sea level right here. Yeah, that's an interesting fact. Um, you think there might be higher points in the state with some of the mountains that are around here, but I guess, I guess it's not. Yep. So. All right, you ready to continue? Yeah, let's hit it. From this point, you can really see how fast the lake drops off here as we're near the deepest point of the lake. All right, so this is about as far east as we're gonna be able to drive on this side of Rim Drive because it, unfortunately the road is closed on this half of the drive because of road work. Yeah, it looks, uh, they've gotta do some uh, work in this park. It's uh, This road is it, in terrible yeah, shape. Yeah, it's everywhere. There's, you know, it's really rough and it needs to be taken care of. It's just terrible. Right here's a really good close-up view of Mount Thielsen. Every time I come to this park, I'm just in awe of the lake and the beauty and just how blue and clear it is. Yeah, I am too. It's uh, probably one of the clearest lakes. I don't know if it's the clearest lake. I know it is. It's got to be the clearest lake in the United States. I don't know about the world, but it's uh, just gorgeous. And I think a lot of the reason it's clear is because they don't allow any boating on it. There's no fishing allowed here. It's just in its natural state. And I hope they keep it that way. And if you want to see how clear this water is, you could just see how clear it is right down there. You can see the rocks underneath that area right there. After we reached the end of the road closure there on the east side, we turned around and then drove all the way around Rim Drive around Crater Lake to the other point of the road closure on the north side of the lake. It took us about 45 minutes to drive almost all the way around the lake. And here are some of the highlights from our drive around Crater Lake.
By the time we reached the end of the road closure there on the north side of the lake, we turned around and then started sightseeing our way as we made our way back towards Rim Village. Here are some of the highlights from stopping at the many scenic pullouts on the north and west sides of the lake. Our first stop on our drive back around the north side of Crater Lake was here at Pumice Point, and you could see out in the distance that the clouds were perfectly reflecting off the water here at Crater Lake, which made for an awesome sight to see. Once again, you can see how clear the water is down there. I believe this lake is more pure than distilled water. Just more awesome views of Crater Lake, huh? Yeah, the same, uh, looking from the north end here, it's beautiful, same thing. Picking up the, uh, the blue from the sky and you can also see the uh, few of the clouds up there. It really amazes me how this lake acts like a perfect mirror, and when there are a few clouds in the sky, you can perfectly see them reflecting off the water here. Our next stop was at Marion Point, which is located here at the North Junction in Crater Lake National Park. By the looks of the many cars and people, this is one of the most popular spots to view Crater Lake here at Crater Lake National Park. You get perfect views of Wizard Island and back towards the south shore of the lake from this point. It was at this point in the day that the weather was really starting to clear up and the sun was moving behind us which really brought out the striking blue colors that this lake is known for. It really takes on the color of the sky on a clear day like this. Just look at this visual right here where my grandpa's standing and then you just get the whole panoramic view of the lake in the background. Pretty cool view right here, huh? Yeah, it's gorgeous, man. You know, it doesn't get much better than this. That is crazy how that tree is basically growing out of that rock right there. Of course, Crater Lake National Park is located in the Cascade Range, which is part of the Pacific Ring of Fire, which is home to many of the world's volcanoes. On a clear day to the north, you can see many of the Cascade volcanoes, such as Mount Thielson, Diamond Peak, and even the Three Sisters on a really clear day. So way out there in the distance, you can see Diamond Lake and Diamond Peak behind it, although it's a little too hazy to be seen pretty clear. Even though it was July 31st when we filmed this, there was still plenty of snow up here at the higher elevations of the park. Underneath the surface of the water, there are a number of cinder cone volcanoes that formed after the eruption of Mount Mazama roughly 7,700 years ago. The largest of these is Merriam Cone, which lies 500 feet below the surface of the water. Our next stop on Rim Drive brought us to the Watchman Overlook, which offers more great views of Crater Lake, and of course, Wizard Island, which is the largest island in Crater Lake. Wizard Island is the largest of these cinder cone volcanoes that formed after the eruption of Mount Mazama and is the only one that goes above the surface of the lake. If you need any evidence of how clear this lake is, you could just see how deep it is there near Wizard Island and you could see all the rocks that lie underneath. Crater Lake is so clear you could see 143 feet below the surface, which at one time was a world record. The cinder cone on Wizard Island rises over 700 feet above Crater Lake. This is amazing, isn't it? Yeah, it really is amazing. This is quite the place here. Can you believe how clear and blue the water is? I mean, you can literally see like what's underneath the island right there. Yeah, it is. It's, um, I don't think I've ever seen anything uh, more clear than this here. Um, saying if you people out there ever get a chance to uh, get here and see this, it's a sight to see. Prior to the arrival of white settlers, Crater Lake was home to a number of indigenous people mostly the Klamath people who lived in this area of Southern Oregon. The first known discovery of Crater Lake by white settlers came in 1853 when three men were searching for a lost cabin gold mine when they happened to stumble by the lake by accident. It was right here at Discovery Point where John Wesley Hillman discovered the lake by accident in 1853. Here at Discovery Point there's a lot of great information about the park itself and the many hiking trails and the status of all those trails as well. It was also here that we saw other wildlife in the park, such as this bird standing on top of this pole here, and a few chipmunks, which were very hard to capture because they were moving so fast, it was just really hard to capture them on camera here, but I did the best I could.
As we were making our way back towards Rim Village, we knew our time here in Crater Lake National Park and the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway was coming to an end, so we made the most of our time here and just soaked in the rest of the views as much as we could before we were leaving later that day. Well, it's been a fun drive around the lake, hasn't it? Yeah, it has been. It's been really, uh, really enjoyable. A lot of nice scenery all the way around, and you know, just a great place. One last look at the lake before we head to the visitor center. Of course, there's views from the visitor center up there of the lake as well. We walked up to the main cafe and visitor center there, which also had a gift shop there at Rent Village. And then we just spent our final time at Crater Lake just soaking in the views there behind the visitor center. While standing here soaking in these last views here at Crater Lake National Park, I was reminiscing about our time on the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway and all the amazing things that we saw along our journey. I was just really happy that my grandpa was able to join me on this trip and I'm really happy we had a good time seeing so many different things between Lassen National Park in California and Crater Lake National Park here in Oregon. We saw many volcanoes, waterfalls, scenic views, and we just had the best time ever. It was easily one of my favorite trips that I've ever been on with my grandpa. Crater Lake National Park was established on May 22, 1902 as the fifth national park in the United States by U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt. I can say from experience that this is one of my favorite national parks in the United States and it doesn't get too crowded which is a shame because I think more people should see this park for themselves. It is one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen in my life. Crater Lake National Park is a must visit if you're traveling in the Pacific Northwestern United States. After visiting Crater Lake National Park, we made our way back towards the city of Medford where we spent our final night on our road trip on the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway. Even though Medford's not on the Scenic Byway, we spent the night here so we could have a straight shot back down I-5 towards California the next day. We did a few things while in Medford. We stopped here to check out the Jackson County Courthouse, we went to go see my grandmother's old house where she lived here many years ago, and then we also got gas and dinner and did a little shopping here before we ended our day on day three. Thoughts on the Jackson County Courthouse? Um, it's a nice looking building, it's an older, you know, it's an older building, it's not a, or it's a newer building. Um, it's, uh, it's nice, it's a nice looking uh, structure. So obviously, Oregon west of the Cascades is known for its like cooler and temperate climate, but Medford almost feels like an extension of California, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It, uh, right now, it's, it's in the 80s. and uh, It was 93 when we yeah, were coming back from Crater Lake. That's true. I don't know if it still is right now, but there is a, there is a nice little breeze blowing right now. So um, it is, uh, it's a similar climate to uh, um, where we live in the Central Valley. Yep, the Rogue Valley here in Oregon has a very similar climate to the Sacramento Valley in Northern California. And honestly, it feels like an extension of California to an extent. Yeah, I agree with that. That's uh, about what it is. You don't start feeling that like Pacific Northwest temperate like climate until you get up there by Eugene in the Willamette Valley. Yeah, that's quite a ways from here. Yep. All right, Grandpa, what are we doing here in Medford, Oregon? We're here at the trailer park that my uh, ex-wife used to live at, and Kyle used to come up here and visit, and he wanted to, it's been like 20 years, so we came by to see if we could find it, find the uh, trailer that she used to live in, and I think we did find it. He wanted to come up here and see it so he could take pictures of it. So I think we found it and have some photos. Yeah. Your ex-wife and my grandma. Yeah. Yeah, it's his uh, his grandmother. My mom's mom. Right. So. All right, so we're here in Medford, Oregon. This picture that I have in my hand here was taken sometime around 2002 or 2003. It was my grandmother's old house here in Medford. 
And here's what it looks like in 2023, 20 years later. So I still remember coming up here as a child and coming to my grandmother's house. I still remember traveling up I-5 and doing all of the sightseeing and even as a young child I knew that like I got the travel bug. Just seeing all those sights coming up the freeway from California, it just makes me think that like maybe this had a big influence on how I created my YouTube channel and my love of traveling. So coming back here is very bittersweet. Obviously my grandma died when I was very young so my memories of her are very limited and obviously I have these pictures right here but it's just really nice being back up here and I'm glad my grandpa's here with me too so. On the fourth day we were making our way back home in California and doing a little bit of sightseeing along the way. Well we're back in California. Yeah there's our famous California sign with our state flower the poppy. Our first stop in Siskiyou County was in the city of Wairika, which serves as the county seat of Siskiyou County. We went to go check out the old and new Siskiyou County Courthouse. The old Siskiyou County Courthouse was built in 1857 and remained in service until 2021 when a new courthouse was built just down the street. The new Siskiyou County Courthouse was completed in June of 2021 and has been in service ever since. It is one of the newest courthouses in the state of California. All right, me and Grandpa are here in Wairika, which is the county seat of Siskiyou County. What do you think of the Siskiyou County Courthouse? Well, the new one that we're standing by right here is pretty nice. It's a nice looking building, but the, uh, the, uh, the other courthouse down the street is really plain. All right, so me and Grandpa are here at Lake Siskiyou. I haven't been here before, and I don't think you have either. No, I've never been here before either, so uh, this is my first time here. I'm looking forward to the view of the lake and, of course, Mount Shasta right out in the distance. Lake Siskiyou is a reservoir along the Sacramento River and is the first major reservoir along the river as well. The lake offers amazing views of Mount Shasta and plenty of recreational opportunities, especially in the summertime. As you can see, they have an inflatable playground here on the lake. I'm sure the kids love playing there. They look like they were having a great time. I've said in the past that Mount Shasta is my favorite mountain and I'm going to stick to that because the views here are just amazing. I just love how Mount Shasta just stands so tall above all of its surroundings and really just catches your eye as you're driving through Northern California. It is truly one of the most magnificent mountains I've ever laid my eyes on. Alright, first time at Lake Siskiyou, what do you think of the view? Well, it's a gorgeous view. You got the lake down below and you, and you got Mount Shasta. And Shastina staring at you. That's nicer. After visiting Lake Siskiyou, we have one final stop in Mount Shasta City, and that was at Black Bear Diner. The very first Black Bear Diner was established here in 1995 here in Mount Shasta City. Not only is it located right off the freeway there off I-5, but you also have amazing views while you sit down and eat. All right, Grandpa, where are we today? Well, we're here in Mount Shasta City at the very first uh, Black Bear Diner. Are you hungry? Yeah. All right, let's go eat. Okay. As of 2023, the restaurant chain has 143 stores in 14 different states. The menu here goes over the history of expansion here of Black Bear Diner, and it also just goes over the history of the restaurant chain as well. It was just really cool being able to eat at the first location here in Mount Shasta City. Alright, what'd you get? 
ham and cheese omelet. It's 2 p.m. and you're eating breakfast? Yeah, why not? Breakfast good anytime. How was your food? It was good. Okay. I was kind of hungry. But it was pretty good, yeah. Traveling on the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway the past couple of days was certainly an adventurous time me and my grandpa will never forget. We got to visit two national parks and see so many amazing sights along the highway and countless waterfalls and amazing views. It is truly one of the best drives you can take here in the United States and I highly recommend it if you ever get the chance to. Me and my grandpa spent the night in Bernie, California, Klamath Falls, Oregon, and Medford, Oregon. Those are three great locations to stay in if you're willing to travel along the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway. There are also hotels in Mount Shasta City, Dunsmere, Weed, and other locations along the highway as well. While we saw many waterfalls such as Bernie Falls, McLeod Falls, Hedge Creek Falls, there are still other waterfalls that we didn't get to see here along the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway. And while we had to skip Lava Beds National Monument due to time restraints, I heard really good reviews about that place and I highly recommend checking it out. While three days was certainly an adventurous time along the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway, it's certainly not enough time if you want to fully explore the byway and see everything that there is to see. I've heard you could spend one or two weeks driving this highway and still not see everything. So if you're going to drive along this highway, be sure to do your research and try to see how many things you want to do and try to plan your trip accordingly, depending on how much time you're wanting to spend on this highway. If you guys have any questions about anything that we saw or covered in this video, please let me know in the comments and I'll do my best to answer them as thoroughly as I can. I hope you guys really enjoyed this video. This is by far the longest video I've ever released on this channel, so I hope you guys are entertained throughout this almost two hour long video here. And if you guys want to see more videos like this with me traveling with my grandpa or some of my other friends or some of my solo travels, please let me know because I really value your guys' opinion. I really hope you guys enjoyed watching this video because it was so fun to make and this is one of the best road trips me and my grandpa have ever been on and we had a really great time and I hope you guys enjoyed riding along with us. Alright folks, it's time for plugs here as we get ready to end off the video here and the first thing I want to plug is my Patreon. So if you guys join my Patreon, you can literally watch all of my videos a few weeks in advance, sometimes even longer than that just depending on how much content I'm making at the moment. So yeah, it's a great way to support me and my YouTube channel and of course all the money that I make on there just goes right back into this YouTube channel and of course the future travels that I go on as well and then the various equipment that I buy to make these videos possible of course. So yeah, I hope you guys will consider joining that. It's just really cool that you guys can support me on there and you guys can just choose whatever level you want to join based on your budget and everything like that. I would really appreciate it if you guys would check it out. There is a link to my Patreon down in the description. And another thing that is set up on my channel is Super Thanks, which is located to the right of where you would normally like one of my videos. What that basically is is just a way for you guys to tip me out for each video going forward if you feel that I've earned it, of course. And then all the money on there also goes right back to this channel to keep producing more of these types of videos in the future. And with all that said, I really hope you all enjoyed this video. This was one of the most fun road trips me and my grandpa have ever been on, and this video was so fun to make. I really hope you all enjoyed it. I just want to thank you all so much for watching, and I know my grandpa would say the same thing. I hope you all have an amazing day, and take care everyone. Thank you for watching.